and thank you all for coming. So uh, I'm presenting uh, a little bit of the research I, I, I've been doing here at the New School uh, for dissertation, uh, Greener Financial Portfolios and, and Economic Policy. Uh, actually, it is a discussion on actually how to bring uh, the private sector and financial markets uh, to the climate debate. Uh, so they can help the climate transition. Uh, of course, uh, the challenge of the climate transition is so big uh, that uh, we, we will need like uh, an active uh, public uh, policy and fiscal policy. Uh, but also, we we'll, we'll have we have to discuss uh, how to make the the private sector step in. Uh, we've seen recently uh, just. For, uh, for uh, an initial background uh, that uh, uh, governments have been released, released several uh, green recovery plans. Uh, so we already have uh, a huge public effort at the same time that I will have new uh, market instruments to help uh, pricing carbon as well as uh, funding uh, uh, green investments, uh, notably uh, carbon taxes uh, to change the relative cost of carbon and green bonds uh, to help uh, investors to leverage resources in financial markets uh, for uh, green investments, actually. Uh, uh, as a background, uh, we should we should know and uh, that this discussion of climate change and financial market has to do with the climate transition and physical uh, actually risks uh, that uh, that global warming will, will bring. Uh, that will uh, uh, recently uh, the ECB and this is the, also uh, in the introduction uh, for our uh, conference uh, discussing the financial instability that. A global warming can bring, uh, found out, uh, estimated that uh, the European GDP can decrease by uh, 12 percent, while uh, the likelihood of the full of climate exposed portfolios uh, by 30 percent. Uh, so indeed, like it demands an economic policy effort and also new technologies, new green technologies. Uh, so this is actually the discussion. Uh, what we've been seeing uh, in the past years, uh, it's a uh, fiscal uh, effort of designing a green fiscal policy, and it has to do with these green recovery plans, with green bonds and subsidies, uh, uh, and, and, and carbon taxes. Uh, just for for you to have a background, uh, there are estimations that uh, we actually need uh, in, in green, green mitigation investments up to six percent of the global uh, GDP. Uh, okay, so it's a lot of money that should be mobilized from private and public uh, capital. Uh, and also, we have monetary policy, financial monetary policy right now that uh, so central banks and financial regulators, they are trying to step in and also help uh, climate transition, of course, because uh, there is the need of not only uh, mitigating or avoiding financial stability in financial markets while uh, the assets, the carbon assets will, will, will lose value and trigger crisis, but also because there are market uh, impact imperfections like credit ratios uh, for, for uh, environmental, for climate investment. So uh, central banks and fiscal policy can help uh, solving these uh, market failures. And in that sense, incentives are, are indeed needed as it's written here in the end, to channel private credit flows to green investors, green investments, and allocate private investors to the climate effort. So uh, here, uh, um, a whole picture of the research agenda, okay, of green financial portfolios. So uh, today I'll present this EC1, uh, which is called Improving Portfolio Decisions with a Green Economic Policy. Uh, but also uh, there is like two essays, uh, one on uh, fiscal policy, the risk of green investments for a green bond market that green bond market that was published by the Journal of Economic Dynamics Control, and a discussion on green monetary policy, green in uh, central banks. Uh, so what's the background of that? Uh, first, financial markets they are carbon biased and short term oriented. So we have to change investors' mindsets. And, and, and economic policy 
can help that. Also, second, conventional, conventional uh, portfolio decision models in the financial markets, such as the, the, the uh, very known uh, KP, KPM, which is a mean variance approach, uh, do not account properly for climate risks and externalities because there are tipping points, uh, because actually uh, these risks are not easy to, to measure. And finally, uh, we have uh, imperfections and, and financial markets and, and credits not being private credits not easily channeled to to green investment, especially uh, green technology and new green technologies which uh, have a higher cost. So this is this is the background, uh, and uh, I, we have actually uh, one big question, which is uh, how to induce a greener investors uh, portfolio decision to protect financial market from climate risks and increase green investments. So we had to make uh, investors also think green uh, so we can uh, avoid financial instability from climate change and also increase green investments. So we, uh, in, in the research, uh, we have two steps. Uh, first, uh, with uh, financial market indices data, uh, I'm able uh, to uh, estimate uh, the monthly annual total returns of green and fossil fuel bonds. Uh, I do that for the US and European Union uh, during 10 years. Okay. Uh, and I try to answer this question. What are the current investors' expectations in the long term for green bond and, and energy bond returns? Why that? To study uh, these returns, investors' decision with the portfolio model, which I'll present here. So, so, so the second step is uh, uh, presenting a portfolio location model um, in which you have green bonds and fossil fuel bonds, it's a Merton type dynamic portfolio model to, to answer the following question. Uh, how economic policy can induce investors to allocate a larger share of, the, of their wealth to green investments? Uh, okay, so uh, this, for the estimations, for the return estimations, uh, I use uh, harmonic estimation, a fast Fourier tr transform. Actually, uh, this is very useful at first because it's uh, it's a method that it's used uh, in in financial markets, but also because we know that green bonds, uh, uh, green investors, they are long term oriented. Uh, they are passion funds, for example, but, and of course, climate gains are long term. Uh, so this method kind of uh, uh, build a low frequency data uh, is moving uh, the returns with a sign consign function like this one, which is shown. Uh, so uh, we have here uh, the estimations uh, you see uh, in the top for the US and the bottom uh, for the European Union for the green bonds and energy bonds. Uh, we don't need to look that in detail, just to show like how it's estimated. So the, the red line uh, is the harmonic estimation, which you, as you can see, uh, it's moved the returns and then you can have a low, a, a low frequency data to be analyzed. Uh, based on that, we can have uh, some initial uh, uh, evidence uh, in discussion. Uh, on, on the behavior and performance of green bonds versus uh, fossil fuel bonds. Uh, Andreas, in the next presentation, will present much more uh, empirical results on that, uh, which is part of our uh, uh, whole research pro project. Uh, but first, uh, there is evidence that green bonds are less volatile uh, than fossil fuel bonds. Okay, and you can see here, uh, based on the cycles that were uh, estimated, that uh, low frequency data shows higher volatility for fossil fuel bonds than green bonds. So then there are benefits in investing green, investing in green bonds, because indeed you have a lower volatility uh, and it's related in financial market theory with lower risks. Uh, also, another question that uh, is usually raised in the lit literature is, are green bonds a good hedge uh, for, uh, for investors uh, against, for example, uh, oil price shocks? And the literature uh, actually shows that green bonds are a good hedge uh, for investors, as it does not have a cool movements with fossil fuel assets. Uh, I do hear uh, a moving correlation uh, to uh, verify the correlation of green bonds and, and fossil fuel bonds returns in the US and Europe. Uh, 
uh, and indeed, like uh, in this data, it's, it's just initial uh, empirical effort. Uh, as, I, as, I, as I said, Andreas will show back more empirical results later. Uh, in the US, uh, the correlation is not too high, uh, but, uh, but oscillates during the period. But in the Europe, European Union, I, I, I found a high correlation, although it has reduced in the past few years. Uh, but actually, uh, that's not what, what the literature uh, says. And uh, these new studies are needed. So as I said, see also at uh, this presentation, uh, uh, the pres Andreas presentation of the study we're doing. And uh, we should note what's important uh, is that uh, these returns still do not account for the climate risks and externalities. We only uh, have four minutes. Okay, great. So then what, 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 what do I do uh, now? I, pre I present uh, a, a Merton uh, portfolio model with positive and negative externalities, uh, in which the returns of green bonds and fossil fuel bonds uh, change uh, with uh, green or fossil fuel R&D, uh, like, uh, as proposed by the endogenous growth theory. Uh, second, the human capital drives uh, growth, but creates climate externalities, and that green innovation can generate increasing returns as an innovation theory. So we, as you can see here in these slides, uh, you have uh, uh, investors that uh, maximize uh, welfare uh, subjected to this decision, which is a, the portfolio with a green and a fossil fuel bond. And, and we have two risk assets. And then we analyze uh, their, their uh, returns. Uh, the return of green bonds and energy bonds depends on innovation, which is here, the, the share of engineers, which are located to, uh, to, to the projects. Okay, if they are green engineers or fossil fuel engineers, and we have a logistic function to adjust for uh, the social returns of innovation. And then we studied uh, climate policy. What's the role of climate policy uh, on that? And in the model, climate policy will shift the returns and impact the volatility. So a, a, a climate policy will ensure higher returns and lower volatility for green and lower returns and higher volatility for fossil fuel. Um, so uh, I'll show you the results uh, for the case in which you have, uh, first for the case in which you have 50% of engineers are located to green R&D. And you see here in the left that uh, asset values tends to decrease in the long run. Uh, here is the asset value. Uh, even with an active climate policy, uh, green bond relative returns are not at attractive enough to divest fossil fuels. And, and you have low, actual low green innovation efforts constraints uh, that, that constraints positive externalities. So that's the reason, and you can see here in the right that uh, uh, investors do, do not fully uh, divest uh, fossil fuels. So that's the reason. Uh, but, but without the climate policy, it's even worse. See, 1.2 is the share of green assets in the portfolio maximum divesting uh, in zero is zero percent of green assets in the portfolio. So here in, in, the, in the right, you can see uh, that uh, how is, is the portfolio decision. Actually, what's the best uh, policy solution as the model shows? The case in which you have an active climate policy and 100% of engineers are channeled uh, to uh, a green, a green R&D. You see here, uh, green and uh, green innovation and climate policy is able to avoid uh, a, a long-term decrease in the asset values. Uh, the asset values kind of recover at some point. And you see here uh, in, in, in the right that uh, investors fully divest fossil fuels. Okay, so uh, what are the main conclusions? Uh, just finishing here, uh, climate investors are long-term oriented, uh, while green bonds tend to be less volatile than fossil fuel bonds. Climate negative, negative externalities tend to decrease asset values in the long run, but an active climate policy together with the green innovation policy can protect investors. And uh, more important uh, than that, an active climate policy is important, can increase returns, can attract investors, but uh, it's fundamental, it's necessary to chain the resources to green innovation activities. So government should uh, uh, lead uh, an active innovation policy 
as well to guarantee uh, the long-term benefits of climate policies. That's it, thank you. Thank you very much, João. Uh, the, anybody have has questions or comments, please raise the hand. Uh, please, Joel. Um, the bonds are rated as green. Is there different gradings of the, of the green? You know, is it real green or non-green? Uh, you know, um, is there equ equity ratings in terms of the, the bonds? Uh, so, sorry, sorry, Joel. Uh, yeah, you're, you're rating the bonds as just you know being green. I'm just wondering if you should maybe differentiate that some are greener than others. That is, uh, it's, and if there's equity involved, you know, uh, along those lines. Uh, great, uh, good question. Uh, actually, uh, yeah. Uh, first, uh, yeah, we didn't differentiate uh, uh, different uh, shades of green, uh, uh, as the literature is discussing. Uh, we could do that, but having a portfolio model with more than two risk assets will be uh, a bit complicated. But maybe, but maybe the empirical, an empirical discussion, uh, we can uh, bring this idea because uh, uh, we know that there is a, a huge discussion about green bonds and if uh, the green bond labels actually uh, ensure that all projects are actually climate oriented, uh, which is a, a policy, an important policy discussion. Uh, but the case of bringing uh, bonds and equity to the model, I think it's 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 not only possible, come uh, uh, but also a, re a research agenda, because here uh, we 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 are uh, I'm I'm just considering green bonds, uh, and I'm saying that green bonds will change. Uh, we, we, we increase returns with innovation, but actually we know that uh, these. Uh, the, the innovation projects are most of them funded by equids, uh, and usually there is uh, a lot of risk uh, involved. Um, so uh, we have uh, we, we we can consider it in the model that, for example, we have a, a, a green uh, convertible bonds in which at some in which we have uh, fixed returns, but at some point, if the technology succeeds, uh, the, the returns increase. Uh, uh, for for the investors, it's type of, or, or either an equity. Uh, so that's the reason that I try to adjust uh, the model uh, with uh, the innovation uh, returns to, to try to consider the case of having equities as well to fund this effort. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I just want to also, I'm an environmental attorney, and a lot of the work we're doing is so-called green jobs and, and federally funded projects has been anti-labor and anti-health you know, situation. So you really have to watch not just the green label, but who's determining that it's green. So I think that that's very important. Thank you. So I think we could uh, move ahead for the next presenter. Uh, thank you very much, João. Uh, now we host Andreas Lichtenberger. He's going to talk about green bonds for a transition to a low carbon economy. Please, Andreas. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk about this project that I have with Willy and Joao. Sorry, I'm just messing around here with my screens. So what I'm going to talk about today is a low carbon um, Green bonds transition to a low carbon economy. We have a little introduction, then a dynamic portfolio model with reinvestment, and then some empirics on, on bond performance that Joao also was already referencing. So the second section will be pretty similar to things that you already saw from Joao, so I probably won't go in there very deep. But as an introduction, also something that just came up in terms of the discussion about bonds and their definition. So the Bloomberg uh, New Energy um, 
foundation, I don't know the F, but the, their definition of green bonds is uh, fixed income instruments for which the proceeds will be applied towards projects or activities that promote climate change mitigation or adaptation or other environmental sustainability purposes. So there is some sort of dedication of what a green bond should actually be good for. And the Climate Bond Initiative, um, they have the green bonds principles, which um, are regional or national guidelines, but people who uh, pub, uh, publish some, these bond state um, follow some sort of voluntary guidelines and um, there is some sort of private certification and uh, prom um, and uh, what what the bonds are used for that should is made public and there should be transparency but it's also kind of not a very clear standard to it um, the data that we use the green bond data from Bloomberg terminal so they are based on issue or self labeling so a green bond is a bond that is kind of issued by a green a green bond company and they themselves then say oh this is a green bond but at the same time they can't only say that they also need to communicate what what are these things used for so we do not dig in explicitly what the qualitative dimension of these green bonds are this is just some little background but yeah it's just a little ca caveat um, I mean, it says here that issuers must commit to deploying 100% of bond proceeds to environmental sustainability oriented activities, and some of these activities are listed here. But then again, there's obviously probably also some greenwashing going on, which is not the topic of this presentation, but this still sh should be kept in mind as some sort of context for green bonds, their usage and need, but also for further research to kind of look into what is actually going on with the data. And as the data are showing, uh, there is an increase in the needs of green bonds, so the utilities as well as carbon taxation. And we see the deployment of various uh, green initiatives, carbon price only, green bonds only, and the combination of the two of them across the globe. And effectiveness of financial markets in kind of helping to go to do this green change, uh, it could either go one way where financial markets could be a roadblock where short-termism of investors might hinder further investment or green financial markets could actually help by uh, achieving our goals for a low carbon transition e.g., by reducing the capital costs of green investments and that's where green bonds come in so our study we first have a dynamic portfolio model as inspired by growth theory with positive and negative externalities um, and empirically we look into different sets of bonds uh, green and uh, non-green bonds. So the dynamic portfolio model, just to give you already some of the results, uh, green investment um, shows some positive externalities and ensures better wealth accumulation actually, and therefore can prevent long-term climate risks. And the externalities effect uh, increase green bond returns and attract investors. So for policymakers, here is a good sign. Uh, resources should act should also be channeled for more green innovation to improve also uh, long term beneficial economic outcomes. And our empirical results sort of support some ideas of the portfolio model that we have. Green bonds do show higher reward to risk performance and also lower volatilities. Uh, results for yields are mixed with regard to the primary and secondary market. And also there are quite some heterogeneities across currencies and sectors. So our results mostly hold for the US dollar and for energy and financial sector, but there are also other sectors and currencies like for euros, the same things don't hold equally. Policymakers should help increasing attractiveness of green bonds could be kind of the take home message for why, uh, how to support the green bond um issue and so the portfolio model i think i'm gonna yeah just gonna skip this because this is sort of also what Shoao already showed here just for the return of green um bonds we have here an externality variable which uh has a, or something that reflects a positive externality so due to the positive environmental aspect of green bonds we would sort of expect a different return effect, the charts that you already saw from Shaw plus the divestment, meant that the 
y value here is 1.2, which means it's not only everything is invested with higher positive externalities effects for green bonds, uh, not only everything is invested into green bonds, but also you divest, you take out some of your fossil fuel assets to then put it again into green bonds that why we're at 1.2 here, not at one. We see an accumulation of wealth for higher alpha, for higher positive externality effects, which is the case of green bonds compared to non-green bonds. And then we also do some stochastic exercises to show that we don't only have deterministic, but also stochastic results for these wealth trajectories. Okay, empirical results. I think I have like 10 minutes or so left for talking. Um, so our hypothesis is that the externality argument for dynamic asset pricing leads to higher and lower returns of green and non-green bonds is sort of captured by idea of um, looking at the reward to risk ratio. So in line with the financial accumulation story from our portfolio model, uh, we say that where, where we see theoretically that better and continuous wealth accumulation is given with green versus non-green bonds, we look at that by using the sharp ratio and saying, well, if we have a certain amount of return and a certain amount of risk or volatility, then continuous accumulation could be related to the idea of the reward to risk ratio that we find in financial literature. And we are also looking into the yields and volatility variable. We use different values for volatilities. Um, and that's something that prior literature hasn't actually investigated that much. In order to run a regression model, we uh, start from the portfolio-based Sharp ratio, which is the average portfolio return minus the risk-free rate over the portfolio volatility, and derive a bond-specific Sharp ratio where we just look at the individual bond return minus the risk-free rate and divide it over the one specific volatility. So we do like several exercises with our data. Uh, we just use a multi, so our data are cross-sectional for one point in time at the end of 2020, where we have different sectors and currencies of bonds from, for the green and the non-green case, where we just use a multivariate regression. Then in order to rule out issuer specific effects, we would pair each bond from the same issuer with a set of criteria like similar maturity, being the same issue, of course, same sector, being the same currency, and um, yeah, I think another issue. So we try to kind of rule out other sort of uh, biases here. Then in the third step, we also try to look at the nonlinear effects in, in, in the volatility and use a classification and regression tree analysis. And in order to also get closer to the idea of fossil fuel bonds, we look specifically at the energy sector. So we have four different sectors, finance, government, utilities, and energy. And since our portfolio model looked at the difference between fossil fuel and green assets, there is unfortunately no single issuer that also issues a green and non-green bonds in the energy sector. So what we tried to do with the energy sector a subgroup analysis is just to see, okay, we cannot pair issuers with uh, green and non-green energy bonds, but we can look at the energy sector and just differentiate there the green and non-green bonds to sort of get closer to the idea of um, what the bond effects are for bonds in the energy sector. Yeah, here a little overview about our data, what we're doing. So, we basically have four different models. We have a baseline model with a couple of regressors. We have sector specific regression and we also include currency specific regression. Um, on the left hand side, as I said before, we look at uh, different yields, the yield at issue, the yield to majority, Y to ETM, and the main sort of regression variable, our bond specific Sharpe ratio, the SRB then a set of uh, controls that we use most importantly the green bond dummy that tells us what the effect for green bonds are and yeah also some yeah, the sectors that we have here and the so, five minutes okay so in order to summarize the results uh, for the 
um, you see the different model approaches in, in the rows and the different regression outcomes in the columns. So for the yielded issue, we see actually a negative, very significant yield in the first case. Also for secondary market yields, we see that green bonds have a negative premium compared to uh, conventional bonds. And however, with the bond specific sharp ratio, we see a positive effect here. So green bonds show, do show a better uh, reward to risk ratio than non-green bonds. Um, comment here in the euro case, we actually mostly don't have a significant result. Then the bond pairing uh, exercise that I already told you, we pair based on the same issuer, which involves also pairing on the same currency. We also pair based on the same maturity and based on the same rating. Um, yeah, then some more details. We use a KNN algorithm if they're like still for one green bond, multiple non-green bond candidates um, to couple that with similar sets of coupon rate values. And we end up with a sub subset of a thousand paired observations. And then we run this green minus conventional regression, which is also done in the literature, like by Capron and Shines. Great study. And let's start with the uh, sharp ratio. We still see that also in this case, uh, we remain with a significant uh, positive sharp ratio here, which means that green bonds do show a higher reward to risk ratio compared to non green bonds. Um, some other observations, we don't have enough observations for the yielded issue because we have too few data points. But compared to before, we don't have a negative green premium, but now actually positive green premium here. Um, the volatility, if, if we look at that, we do see that for US dollars, green bonds show lower volatilities than non-green bonds, especially in the energy and the government sector. Uh, Results, however, are not exactly the same for euro bonds, where conventional bonds already seem to be a lot less volatile than for US bonds. So the nonlinear perspective with the classification and regression tree analysis, um, what does it show us? We see for the 90 day volatility that there tends to be a higher volatility in the energy sector. Volatilities tend to be lower in the government sector and Something that fits our story again is volatility seem to be higher for non-green bonds than for green bonds. And to look last but not least at the energy sector perspective, what we see here is again for the yielded issue, we don't have enough data points. If we look at the interaction effect of green bonds and volatility, we see that uh, being green um, actually reduces the yield to majority ratio in the, in the interaction term. And for the sharp ratio, we do see again that green bonds show a positive reward to risk ratio. So to summarize the results, what our main, uh, what our main conclusion, our main sort of level of analysis is, is if we look at the sharp, uh, sharp bond specific sharp ratio, we actually do see that green bonds could provide incentives for um, in the financial market for long-term investment to reward investors with a, with a higher reward to risk ratio. Um, results for the yields are sort of mixed, but this is also a little bit what you find in the literature. And with our conclusions, we see that the dynamic portfolio model, the green investment has positive externalities, which can prevent long-term climate risks in financial market. Uh, it can reduce capital costs for, for green investments and therefore resources should be channeled for green research and development. Our empirical studies um, tend to support those observations from the dynamic portfolio model. Better investment, there are better investment opportunities for green bonds, especially when it comes to the reward to risk ratio. Uh, volatilities tend to be lower and results for yields are mixed. And in addition, we also see that there are differences for currencies and sectors. So actually, the, what I mostly was talking about was also the average effect of our data. But if you look into the specific uh, subcategories, it's mostly driven by US dollar effects. And you, we also saw that for euros, things tend to be a little bit different. So there is, I think, enough work to be done for future research. 
and policymakers could step up and also help increasing attractiveness of green bonds and push the agenda forward. So, yeah. Thank you for your attention. And if you want to read up a bit on it, we also have a World Bank report that already discusses the issue of green bonds and fiscal policies. Thank you very much, Andy. Um, questions, comments, suggestions from our audience? Yes, Julia, please. Yeah, thank you so much for really excellent uh, research. Can I ask uh, Joao and Andreas um, a question that I could not answer? I was asked that two days ago and I could not give an informed answer. What is the relationship of green bonds and sustainability and artificial intelligence? And uh, do we have any data on this? I could not give any answer, so I ask uh, you. I mean, it's kind of a threefold question what you're asking. I mean, the relation of green bonds and sustainability is, I think, something that is well researched and also that we are, are asked and have been asked. And I think that's not sort of the focus of our study. I think you can try to see how much green bonds actually do further green investment. Um, I think Shaw especially looked a bit more into that and the artificial intelligence angle um i have no idea i have no idea about artificial intelligence and i also actually don't really know in which way this question goes because it's like the whole field itself so i don't know do you mean that with artificial intelligence investment would increase or investment would be made differently or what yeah it's like too broad to kind of understand where it goes yeah, so are these, uh, or is there any interconnection? Are these green bonds usually also, then we also have this uh, highly critical literature on cryptocurrencies, how much energy uh, cryptocurrencies are using up. So is this actually, uh, do we want to go into artificial intelligence and then be uh, sucking so much energy? Or uh, is this a way to make uh, production more efficient? And this is critical and, and it seems to be a question out there that is not answered. Yeah, I mean, cryptocurrencies are not in a good environmental light because they need a lot of server power to fuel all these uh, factories of mining for the blockchain algorithm solution. So, yeah, that's definitely a downside of it. I, I mean, you can have green bonds without having cryptocurrencies. So I think there is definitely, and the and the main idea of green bonds is not to host, uh, um like a primary medium of exchange but to provide some sort of funds for then have something for real investment so it should optimally improve like the situation of our production system to green it and transition to a low carbon economy but again how that clearly uh from the investment to the to, or from the from the financial market to the green investment side how that exactly goes and what happens with the CO2 emissions on all the way, it's, I think, uh, subject to a lot more research. <laughs> yeah, I think that's kind of what I'd say about it. If Shaw wants to add something, you're welcome. No, thank you. You, you answered very well. There, there, there's a, a large discussion on uh, green bonds, digitalization, and green investment intelligence that there is interest in. Uh, I, can, I can share with you, Julie, as well. Maybe on uh, on um, the issue of uh, well, financial instruments and sustainability, I think uh, that for everybody we should have somewhat in mind. And so sustainability um, basically means that you avoid long run negative externality of uh, the, the economy nature to others, or sustainability also means you introduce some innovations that go somewhat in a more progressive, uh, inclusive uh, uh, direction. And now the question is, if your financial instruments doesn't show up your two uh, well intentions that you have with sustainability, does it show up in, uh, is that priced in, in the asset prices and the asset return? And this is, um, somewhat a starting point of our whole research on this. 
that is a very complex uh, uh, interaction in financial market. It's very hard to figure this out. There are research says, oh yes, there is a green premium. In other words, uh, if you issue bonds, they will have lower returns because they have a, um, lower uh, externality cost and uh, uh, leads to lower um, um, capital cost when you invest into green technology. So uh, this is basically the starting point of our analysis, but it's hard to uh, tie this down in data in, in the financial market dynamics because also a lot of financial market dynamics is just driven by arbitrage and they don't care about sustainability. So uh, this is a very big, uh, big task, but it's a good question. Thank you. Anyway. So. Yeah, thank you very much with the end this presentation. We came <clears throat> to an end for our first session. And then we move forward to the second session, which is going to be moderated by João Paulo. And the, please, João. Okay. Thank you, Jose, for that. And thank you all for the presentations in the first session. Um, uh, this session is planned until uh, 1 30. Uh, and then uh, we have a lunchtime uh, before uh, the uh, presentation of Professor uh, Bruno Meyer uh, on, on, on his book. Uh, so uh, let's keep the same rules. 15 minutes presentation, uh, five minutes comment. I'll let you know when, when there is a five minutes missing uh, through a direct message. Uh, and also, I can interrupt too if you, if you prefer. Uh, the, the, uh, really, uh, the first presenter is a Damian, uh, it should be Damian Parker uh, uh, on his Definitely. research on QE monetary policy. Did the QE monetary policy contribute to an equality and wealth distribution? Do, uh, do, do, do you want to talk? I, 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 is Damian here? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, it's really bad news. So, uh, we, but that uh, put is also some good news. Uh, namely, we have more time for the other speakers. So, uh, Damien is uh, got stuck in an um, uh, air, air, uh, air uh, flight, and so he uh, will not come. I wrote this paper with him. I can make some few remarks uh, on this, and then what we have in mind there. But uh, we have then more time for the other speakers. So, yeah. So, um, sorry for this. Um, well, uh, um, disappointment of expectations that you saw, uh, try to uh, see uh, Damien speaking here. Yeah? So um, the uh, paper is uh, issuing, well, pursues an issue of, um, um, if you have these big meltdowns, so to speak, financial market meltdown, or also the corona or COVID meltdown, uh, the financial market is seem to perform pretty well so in <laughs> in these uh, periods and so um the, behind this is of course a lot of uh, well, monetary and fiscal policy why is that is the case and in particular we are pursuing there the issue of monetary policy and in the um, financial market meltdown uh, period after 2007-9 the um, issue came up that, uh, well, central banks are moving from low interest rate policy, which is a traditional first line of defense, so to speak, to uh, uh, having QE and unconventional monetary policy, basically driving down the risk premium for um, risky assets with their policy. But they uh, uh, drive up the risk price sorry, they drive up the asset price of uh, equity and other value uh, assets. And this gives rise to a big effect on income and wealth distribution. So as the central banks were um, uh, um, confronted with this problem, well, don't you now create a huge wealth disparity with your new policy? And uh, Bernanke and uh, Draghi and uh, the world central banker all responded to that and saying, no, well, we also uh, create new jobs and produce new income for unemployed uh, um, people and families can get, 
uh, higher income and so on the labor side that improves uh, this economic situation. And now we had the problem so uh, that to measure the asset price effects of the central bank um, policy and to show that actually the um, well, a wealth disparity um, and the wealth distribution got worse since the QE policy was introduced. It's a heavily debated topic among the central banker, also the IMF and uh, policy institutions. And so we have figured out a way with uh, using a, a survey of consumer finance data from the Fed to uh, pursue this question of uh, the uh, uh, well, rising wealth distribution uh, due to this big those big meltdowns. Yeah, so you see, it's a very very important uh, uh, question there. What uh, the uh, side effects are of uh, monetary policy, and we actually find that um, uh, there is some uh, uh, increase of uh, well uh, wealth disparity, and we measure this with some distance measures there into the data. And so I don't want to go into the details, but this is a major idea of this uh, paper. And uh, it's also the version, uh, early version is on social science research network. You, you can look at this and you can uh, have a, a, well, your own um, evaluation of that. So I only wanted to uh, this introduce what we do there, but I think we have now more time for the other um, presentation. So Joe, you can take over. Now again. Thank you, Professor. Really. Uh, okay, so uh, we can continue then. Uh, the second presenter uh, is uh, Uriel Kudina. Uh, Uriel uh, will present his paper, Assessing the Speed of the Green Transition with the Flash Assembler Model uh, of Mode Sector Growth. Uh, Uriel. Please, the floor is yours. Yo. Are we all? I sorry, yeah, yeah I'm just like <laughs> looking for my presentation. Sorry about that, and I then I muted myself. So thank you for, uh, so much, uh, Willie, Ze, and Joao for organizing this such an interesting workshop on climate economics. Um, first of all, I wanted to just announce like a sort of disclaimer. Um, like on Tuesday, I got diagnosed COVID-19, like in the sixth wave. So I'm a bit under the weather. So I hope like that maybe like these extra 10 minutes that they will have, I will try to go on point and fast as I can, but like, uh, please uh, ask me if I cannot clear in some moments or so. Okay, so we could keep on. So first, I mean, like that's like my research question. Just like to say, like very briefly, is uh, the question. I mean, like that. I mean, a lot of like these neoclassical you know, models, for example, the one like by like Nordhaus, uh, the Dice model, etc. Like rely a lot on computing optimal policies, you know, and like looking at a kind of trade-off between acting upon climate change. And like the costs of that, you know, and then trying to uh, engage in like what is like the optimal like, uh, trade off that one finds. The problem is that these kind of models like eventually get like, up producing, like, I don't know, like the optimal temperature increase that we may receive is, I don't know, 3.5 Celsius, which maybe for an economist makes sense, but like if you are a meteorologist, that means that like our atmosphere will be like the one of Venus or Mars, <laughs> and that's actually like uh, kind of sustain. Uh, human life would so um, it's, it was a kind of problem so like the my question was instead of like focusing on what is optimal is uh, how much time we have left in order to try to decarbonize the economy it's like can we and now there's all these um alarmist um messages that oh yeah we have like 12 years to act upon climate change we have 20 years so there's all these empty promises in cop 26 and by 2030 we should decarbonize, but is that feasible? Like, does like the production structure of like a particular country allow this to happen? And how can we really like, um, sorry, 
and how can we really like use fiscal policy in order to uh, facilitate like this transition? And with this kind of critical question, like I also try to um, address this debate whether like neoclassicals would say that carbon pricing should be like in office of the European tax in order to uh, tax the externality of climate change or whether like because of climate change is impending, is looming and we really need to do something as soon as possible. We also need quite a quantity adjust, like based mechanism in order to really like do the decarbonization transition or whether, you know, just prices are enough. So but these were the kind of questions that I tried to address in uh, my research. Um, so just to show like, the optimality trap that I call it, like here, as I was saying, the optimal policy is like 3.5 Celsius of uh, temperatures. Like this is uh, completely untenable from the kind of any kind of approach. And instead, like not doing anything, the climate policy cost X is like, sorry, um, sorry. Like, and like, this kind of models also like imply that the climate policy cost, because it's always positive, by not doing anything against climate change, the climate or like climate change actually has economic benefits because do, dealing with climate change that like, has costs. So not doing anything without benefits. I mean, these were like particular like kind of questions that were really bothering me. And I was like trying to just address. Um, in order to do so, I used, uh, as I was mentioning, this juxtaposition between in a classical optimization versus classical time, I was using a, a very interesting dynamical model, multi-sector growth that was done by, or coined by uh, Peter Flasher, who recently passed away, and Elisander, who is here with us. Um, that also includes technological dynamics. And then we, uh, I empirically calibrate uh, the model with uh, six developed economies, and using a simple like, random effects model with variance varying slopes and uh, then try to substitute particular, particular namely like C19, which is a manufacturing of gold, petroleum, and or refined petroleum products, and D, which is electricity distribution and, and management. Um, and we try to really uh, see how the like, fiscal policy can accelerate uh, the decarbonization, the technical substitution of this particular sector that tend to have a lot of carbon content by a kind of synthetic uh, green sector, you know, that can replace it and see like what are the important parameters of play. And the uh, directed technical change and how we enforce it, the particular policy, it's not like green bonds or of the kind that could be also very interesting to explore, but uh, tax subsidy form. You know, so then we just tax uh, carbon output and we use part of the share of this carbon output in order to um, do uh, green subsidies. You know, and then like, depending on this, we can accelerate or not the, the carbonization policy. Um, so after calibration, what we do is just 14,000 simulations that with respect to these four uh, dominant parameters. First, like the technical efficiency would be a kind of cost, relative cost efficiency of the carbon sector with respect to the green sector. So for instance, like uh, 0 0.7 means that the green sector would be 70% more cost efficient than the carbon one. Then we have the initial output ratio, the direct like initial investment, so that you know, the, how like the transition starts. And then this tax, uh, tax subsidy policy mix between like carbon and green subsidies like tau and tau prima. This allows also to explore like the, to what extent like also we need green subsidies in addition to carbon taxes or not. And it gives us like interesting like numbers to explore. Um, so just like the main results are like here sketched. I mean, like I'm going to show like the visuals at the end, but just to big surprise like fiscal policy does accelerate the phase out of carbon sectors and regardless of production structure or, in, or relative technical efficiency. So like the technical elements, the production elements are not that relevant. What is important is the policy. And if we don't do like this like kind of fiscal policy, we will never reach the targets of the UN time. And for instance, there's just 
mentioning it here, but then like effective, like the carbon taxes are really effective on its own. In the model, what they do is distort, uh, or they don't change any kind of preferences or so, but like what they do is uh, increase the profit rate differential between the, the carbon and the green sectors. And then this also like, increases the differential in growth. But some, but this is not enough, and or it's very helpful, but just adding, for instance, not having any kind of subsidy and adding like a 100% subsidy, one can just reduce the time of the colonization in half. I'm going to just like show graphs to the direction. But instead, like we might also need green subsidies, especially because like we have like only maybe 10, 15, 20 years. So first I'm going to just briefly, and I have to briefly uh, sketch the model here. Like, I mean, let's say everyone if you're trained in the classical tradition, I don't have to really like go to maybe like the details of it, but it's a model, a dynamic model of multi sector growth that produces some kind of like lockable terra uh, complex oscillations, you know, like prey predator dynamics, very similar to the Goodwill cycle that it represented before. Um, the equilibrium in that case, when the oscillations are around, there's Rafa van Neyman equilibrium. Of like uh, balanced growth and I mean, that's <laughs> conventional interpretive analysis, and but then the, the dynamical aspect of it is like a cross dual dynamical adjustment model where the two laws um, at play are the law of excess demand it's in the classical sub and the law of excess profitability of the uh, also added by the classicals. So, well, I mean. I already know the Zappa van Neumann equilibrium, so I will jump over this slide, but essentially two part two assumptions, equality of supply and demand, and uniformity of profit rates. Then the, the dynamics and like this cross-dual dynamical adjustment happens where you have an imbalance in between the demand and supply will trigger change in prices. So if you have more demand and supply, you have an increase in prices. While uh, when you have an imbalance between revenue and costs, which is like a deviation from normal profitability, you have capital flowing to that particular set of production, expanding the quantities, you know, so like the change the trigger is a positive change in quantities. And then like the supply will increase versus demand. So then like prices will decrease and uh, capital will flow out to an, another set of production because the profit rate will go below normal profitability. So this is what generates the sketch of the business cycle in this particular model of multi sector oscillations. And the only thing that we are interested in computing is these delta coefficients that are like the adjustment coefficients between the imbalances and, and uh, prices and quantities. So here, just to get an idea of how like, the model operates in a, in a synthetic way, these are it's a science sector US economy. Five, five um, minutes, sir. This Thank you so much. So I will just accelerate from here on. This is just a sketch of the oscillations for us, an example of science sector US economy. Uh, when one also plots in a two dimensional plane, the excess demand, excess unit profit versus the changes in prices and quantities, one sees these uh, linear adjustments and these linear slopes. And the point is that with real data, with uh, EU claims and WILD data, uh, we compute and estimate the particular adjustment coefficients. These, for instance, are like the 60, like, yes, yeah, 60 adjustment coefficients because it's like for each sector of the economy uh, for quantities, you know, for like Germany, France, Italy, Japan, Netherlands, and USA. So you can see in some cases, these adjustment coefficients are negative to the left of the vertical axis. And in that particular case, of course, it's a moment where the law of excess profitability doesn't work or the, in other cases, the law of excess demand doesn't work. Then they like will shock some of the classical analysts. But oh well, and finally, these are like the years that we are trying to address, 16, 23, 51, and 65 are the particular UN IPCC targets. And these are like the parameters of the other comparing events. Just, I will just jump over the comparative statics, but the whole point is that by adding a taxes and, and subsidies, one can play with the profit rate and those rate differentials of the model. 
So here one sees like prices, first output, profit rate and growth. This is a particular simulation for Germany that tries to do like this uh, carbon substitution between the green sector, that would be this one, C19, and the an equivalent like carbon one, would be the C19. There's no tax rate whatsoever, but the synthetic green sector has a 70% of efficiency with respect to the carbon one. And in spite that one has really like a profit rate differential here and a growth rate differential there, just because the production structure just makes that one has a 500 years of adjustment speed. So, you know, even having like a very high investment, initial investment ratio, very favorable cost efficiency, one needs like 500 years in order to do this particular transition and make with, with in a policy. As soon as we add, uh, like we just with 1% like the carbon output and we use all this carbon output in order to finance uh, green subsidies, like we just reduce from 500 years to uh, 70 years the decarbonization speed. So like one sees like how like actually fiscal policy really can impact on, on the carbonization. And finally, when one does we just a thousand like simulations just comparing by like, all the particular um, adjustment parameters. And one sees that the tax rate and subsidies are the parameters that have the greatest impact on the, on the adjustment speed. So as I was saying like uh, before in the main results, for example, one has like 10% uh, of a tax rate, which is a lot like a ten, uh, tax rate on carbon output of 10%, but with without subsidy, and these are like the subsidies like in red, one has a transition in 51 years. Instead, when one like increases, uses all that carbon tax in order to subsidize green technologies, one can go from this 10% to already 23 years, which is the, the purple straight line. Also one goes from here to here, like reduced in half. One can also do it, I don't know, 25% of uh, carbon tax, it's like 22 years, the carbonization takes place. But then with full subsidy, you go from red one to the purple one, which is in 10 years, you have already the carbon tax. So you're actually able to cut it in half. And technical efficiency and initial investments have very like uh, small impact. Like the important impact is precisely in, in the two, um, like in the fiscal policy needs. And finally, I mean, maybe like the last slide that they have here, but this is the regression that I returned. One sees that there's like highly significant values for all of the parameters and the tax one. And in this case, like we just take part, yes, yeah, so I'm done. I think that I'm done with that. And I just like, thank you. And I'm really like looking forward to your comments. Um, I don't, am I right on time? Or? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Like, <laughs> okay. Uh, right on time. <laughs> oh, perfect. Okay, so if you uh, have like follow-up questions. Thank us, thank us, thank us so much, Ariel, for 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 your presentation. It was great, clear, and and on time. Uh, okay. So, uh, any any comments, question uh, for Ariel? Uh, we have some time for that now. Please raise your hands. Those who want to address a question. No question. I, I, I actually, I actually do have a question. Then, uh, 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 these plots uh, in which you compare uh, the profit rates and the prices, uh, can you? Um, no. Yeah, before the different countries. Yeah. Oh, okay. You mean this? Yeah, a relative price uh, and, and 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 profit rates. Yeah, this. Oh, my, my uh, Ibrahim also has a, a question, but um, the other one, profit rates and, and prices, relative prices. My question is, is uh, what are the relation the relationship actually in the model between these variables, if there are any uh, uh, relation between these variables. Uh, if they are 
connected in some sense, like price and profit rates, and you know, so that's. Oh, prices and profit rates. Maybe let. Um, so maybe I can go back here. Yeah, this one. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I just like went uh, very fast. Um, so essentially, yeah, one has the law of excess profitability. Uh, what it relates is an imbalance in prices, but actually in profits, to uh, a change in quantities. Like here, like to the left hand side, you have the change in quantities. Actually, balance is not strictly in prices or it's in unit, price. you know, like it's the revenue and the costs. Um, but that's um, how it goes. And the only thing is that it works almost like, you know, as a kind of machine learning algorithm where the what has just to compute these adjustment coefficients. And the only requirement of the model is that these adjustment coefficients are positive. But for the data, I mean, I could try to look for like better data, like in like longer term series or like one that is not like every year, because then, you know, one can have many of these oscillations and you are like, you need like better data. Like that is not that good. But I don't know if I'm like, I don't know if I really got to question and even yeah, yeah. if I responded with you. No, thank you. Yeah, that's it. Uh, okay. And also, Ibrahim has a question. He raised his hand. Yeah, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I have a quick question. I apologize. Maybe I, I probably missed it in the, your presentation. So, is uh, my question is regarding the uh, carbon tax or the tax, right? You apply it. Do you apply it on the capital or on emissions? I, I'm sorry if I probably missed the point here. Or... Um. So no, I, I applied at the end the model only has like um, quantities and prices and what they do is like uh, change like quantities. Like the, the fiscal policy method it does is just tax out carbon output and sometimes uses part of this carbon output in order to finance uh, the green technology. You know? like, and that's only how it goes. There's no, I mean, one could think of it as a kind of, Tags on profits or on real output. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but hmm. I don't know. So, for instance, I mean, uh, yeah, maybe here. So, yeah, I mean, that's like the tax here, if you go profit rate differential with policy. How is the tax rate? So essentially, we take part of this uh, of the carbon sector output, and you take out a, a share tau of it. And part okay, of this, hmm. no, I no, no, I get it now. So from the okay, so it's just playing with yeah with the profit rate differentials, and I really like the model because it's like so classical in its approach. You know, there's like no preferences whatsoever, and you don't have to think about optimality. You already take that the we, we don't want the temperature to increase more. No, you just want to achieve the carbonization as a kind of objective. Um, yeah. um like okay. we thought no, sorry. Okay, great. So uh, any other question or do we move to uh, the next presenter? Maybe Willy has a Will, question. Uh, Willy, Willy. Yeah. This is probably uh, very related as you sort of to uh, what um, uh, we saw before, what uh, Etoro was doing, so to speak, the adjustment speeds and how long does it take actually to transform the industrial sector toward a green economy. So, and there are very pessimistic views uh, in growth theories and macroeconomics and uh, also, um, Etoro had some, uh, well, this is uh, results are depending on the adjustment speed. And uh, I think this is a good um, um, point. Now, uh, of course, one might want to make an adjustment speed also depending on other things. So let's say on the um, um, size of the difference uh, in uh, profit 
profitability differences across, across the different sectors or other things. But here they are, as I understand, they are linear and so they could be also made uh, depending on other things. And so it may then hopefully go faster, but he has that with some tax and subsidies uh, working faster. But I think this is an important question. So, um, Oral, you have something on um, the speed of adjustment to see how one can, how else one can uh, model this? I can, um, oh, sorry. Um, how can, uh, sorry, I, like I, I got like a blank. Um, yeah, I, I was also like, sometimes I think, I mean, because it's just like a linear adjustment, one can use also like different like functional forms to see like it works better. Um, I was also thinking like, yeah, that the delta coefficient, I use the same for carbon and the green sector, but maybe, you know, it's an elasticity you know, to profits, you know, and to, and to like demand and maybe, you know, like one can see if like there's different values for that. I try to look at empirical reports to, to calibrate this, but it was like a bit difficult. And um, uh, what was going to say? Sorry, just like, no. um, sorry, I just I <laughs> got black. Um, Basically, like the research, yeah, of course, like one can be like very pessimistic. I think, like, what I just wanted to show is that if like politicians like really like decided to, I mean, there's like this work by Andreas Malm who talks about like the need of doing like ecological Leninism, you know, and like, kind, of, kind of like work communism in order to be able to address the climate crisis. You know that there's no new deal anymore. You know. World War One kind of situation where capitalism is driving us towards. So the point was saying, yeah, like if we had some kind of new economic policy, like Lenin style, yeah, one can really decarbonize the economy quite fast. But of course, one needs political will or the disposition for that. And of course, in that sense, I'm very pessimistic in the sense that uh, liberal politicians are going to do anything for that to change. I mean, but to be kind of peace. Uh, in support of ecological animism, if that makes sense. So it was like, I mean, like the underlying goal of my paper. Uh, I don't know if I responded to your comments. Sorry, I just got distracted. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, great. So, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Ariel. So, let's move to the next presenters, the next presenter, actually, just one, uh, which is. Uh, who is um, José, uh, José Pedro? Uh, José Pedro Bastos Neves. Uh, he will present uh, carbon left tax a proposal. So, José, the floor is yours. Fifteen minutes. All right. Thank you very much. Everybody can see my my slides. Yes. All right. So I'm going to present today uh, this work I'm doing with Professor Willis Semler, which basically is a proposal for uh, what we are calling a carbon wealth tax. So to just uh, to give a, a general overview of what I'll be talking today, first I'm going to motivate a little bit uh, our research and our proposal. In fact, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about climate crisis and the daunting fiscal scenario. Then I, I'm going to say exactly what we mean by a carbon wealth tax, which is a new thing, basically. Um, uh, after that, we uh, we're going to see uh, some implications of this scheme that we are proposing to the, eco uh, to the economy. So in the first step, we're going to do some harmonic estimations for green and brown assets in US. And finally, uh, I'm going to introduce and also give some results of our dynamic optimization portfolio model. Uh, so the first thing I would like to uh, draw your attention to today is that uh, the carbon taxation, the classic car the carbon taxation, uh, doesn't seem to be um, solving our climate problems. So in the left-hand uh, graph, we can see that both coverage and the revenues associated with tax, uh, carbon tax are increasing. Uh, but there is still a lot of ground to cover. Um, the right uh, hand side graph, you can see that the announced pledge scenario 
uh, the, 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 the carbon emissions are decreasing far less than it will be required to meet the Paris uh, goals by 2050. At the same time, especially after the COVID response um, uh, policies, the fiscal scenario is more challenging. Um, the, all over the world, the, the, the government's engaged into fiscal and monetary policy that resulted in a higher uh, government debt as share of GDP. We see that in the left uh, graph here, the advanced economies, for instance, um, they incurred in 20 points uh, percentage of GDP in, in, in higher uh, expenditures. And at the same time, uh, a longer trend on revenues on government revenues indicate that uh, the, the, the governments are um, collecting less money as revenue. So the right uh, graph here we see, especially the corporate income tax decreasing in all regions of the world. This is from an OCD uh, report. And I actually uh, get the, the slide out of the presentation, but the third thing I'd like to uh, also notice that is that we have an increasing wealth inequality. I know that all of you are well aware of this, but basically, at least in the United States, the first, uh, the 1%, uh, well, uh, the 1% uh, holds the same wealth as they held in 1940, like over, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 20% of total wealth. Uh, and in the middle of this context, uh, there, there have been, of course, some proposals of introducing wealth tax uh, wealth taxation. Um, ma mainly here, I'm using the works by Seiz and Zuckman, which I think is the most popular one, and possibly you have heard of it already. Also, there are more uh, economic hardcore models developed by Gunnar Venero and Jacobson in 2020, 2019 and 2020. Uh, basically what they consider is a taxation on companies, individuals net worth, uh, but also it could be thought as an additional tax on capital gains for individuals above certain income threshold. If you follow uh, the US, Con US Congress discussions, I think three weeks ago, Basically, for the three hours they were considering this, it's what they uh, try to implement uh, in practical terms. Um, and some criticisms that often uh, authors point is that these kind of taxations are more or less uh, opaque. So it's hard to actually know what a net worth is for individuals, for instance, and that is also uh, it also entails capital flight away from the country that introduced it. So basically the rationale that we thought uh, for taxing brown assets, um, there, are, uh, they are, there are two rationales. The first one is that uh, there is this benefit principle, which has a long history in, in the economic history, uh, economic thought history which basically uh, says that more access to public goods, you have to tax more. Uh, but also this is true for the reverse. So if you're responsible for public debt, you also have to pay more because of that. And the second reasoning is that uh, actually brown capital implies a non-excludability. Um, and I mean by that, that it locks the economy in a sustainable path and nobody can opt out. Uh, from it. So even though you're very conscious uh, about the problems that um, climate change may uh, imply in your life, you cannot like um, get out of uh, this world trend. And, and also in this context, if, you, the, if the capital flies away from brown, brown sectors is actually a good thing, uh, or is actually what we are looking for in a green transition context. So here I uh, I'm bringing this graph by Tong and all. Um, basically, what he says is that uh, you can see the, the several uh, carbon emission paths. Uh, the one associated with the Paris uh, Accord is, the, uh, is this RCP 2.6. And he's saying that given our current infra infrastructure, we are, also, we are already consuming all of our carbon budget 
uh, for the next decades. So um, it's impossible to avoid, if you are really serious about committing to the Paris goals, it's impossible to continue with this kind of capital structure that we currently have. Uh, so next, uh, just to get ideas fixed, um, when we say about a carbon wealth tax, we're saying basically this first equation that you're seeing in, uh, in the slide. Uh, here is the logarithm returns on asset prices. And uh, we put a small, um, it's not a small, but a, a taxation on these returns, right? It's possible to show that if you tax, um, if you have a high tax on capital gains, this may be equivalent to taxing net worth, which is what, um, uh, which are, uh, is what the, the authors uh, consider, the literature consider. And the main advantage is that the, the implementation is straightforward. I mean, uh, IRS already oversees capital gains and, uh, and, and it, it wouldn't be uh, much trouble implementing this. And for sake of completeness, uh, I'm putting here also the equation of green uh, returns on green invest uh, on green capital in case of subsidies. So this is a long uh, literature as well, saying uh, 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 trying to to put forward the idea that we need to subsidize green investments in order to uh, do the green transition. And and both of these equations are going to enter the model later on. Uh, the basic uh, method, uh, empirical challenge that we have uh, dealing with this, um, the, the, our proposal of, of a green, uh, um, a carbon wealth taxation, is that we have to uh, have a way to discriminate between brown and green companies. Uh, if you look at the literature, there are a lot of uh, studies that do this uh, differentiation, but they focus on sectors. And given that we're talking about taxation, uh, we need some uh, company level discrimination. I'm not going to talk a lot about uh, this here because of time, con time constraints, but I should say that we are using here um, ESG um, database precisely the MSCI uh, ESG ratings database, which comprises more than uh, 9,000 companies and bonds. Basically, our strategy is to select those that are in the S&P 500, because we need uh, data from stock, uh, um, stock prices. And we need also companies that are in, that are in crucial sectors for a, green, for a green transition. So that means that we don't really want to focus on big techs, for instance, that are already in a sector that doesn't pol don't pollute that much. So we really wanna try to focus on oil and gas, transportation, or these um, more crucial sectors. And basically we use this carbon emission score, uh, which uh, th there are several agencies that, um, uh, that, 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 that do this work of uh, grading companies on how they are faring in, uh, in green actions. So for those uh, with low grades, we call them the brown companies and we're gonna tax them in our, uh, <laughs> in our uh, theoretical exercise. And the green companies are those with a good grade, so above 7.2. Um, and those are gonna be recipients in, of uh, green subsidies. Uh, and four minutes. Okay, I'm gonna. Uh, basically, here we have the estimated returns from 2010 to, into 2021. We are running also a fast Fourier transform, which means that we are um, cleaning up uh, from uh, high frequency oscillation. So this basically is the is a, a long term tendencies of our uh, two kind of companies. Uh, Regarding the dynamic optimization portfolio model, this is uh, we are assuming that there is only one investor, three, three assets, the safe green and brown, and the returns at time vary. Uh, crucially here is the variable pi2, which is the share of assets that our investor chooses to, to invest. Um, and I'm moving now to the, uh, to the results of our estimations. The first one is that when we introduce a classical 
uh, carbon taxation. That means a taxation on uh, goods. Uh, basically, what happens is that the investor uh, chooses to consume less uh, of what uh, relate uh, relatively to what he consumed before. So it doesn't change exactly its uh, portfolio decisions. It changes its consuming uh, decisions. Uh, if we uh, in this graph we, we plotted the wealth dynamics path and we see that uh, we have substantial results when we uh, when we uh, introduce high uh, taxation so the green and, and pink lines here are both for 40% uh, uh, of taxation uh, the, the stronger impacts are in the middle periods, and this is associated with uh, portfolio uh, choices, and you're going to see this more uh, later uh, in the next slide. Uh, but even like if you consider all the, the, the periods, this, uh, uh, the, the dynamic nature of our model means that uh, higher tax, we have a, a better wealth path. Um, that's the, how the returns on brown and green assets behave in case of subsidies and taxation. We see that the main changes are for, uh, happens in the first uh, half of the periods. And that's mainly because uh, the wealth in these periods are, are higher uh, and that wealth is the tax base. So that's uh, quite expected. And here is the behavior of, of the portfolio allocation. Um, we see that importantly in the 40% taxation we have uh, up until the period 20, we have a, a higher share of, um, of, of capital allocated to green investments rel relatively to the business as usual scenario. Uh, to conclude, so uh, what you're like, it's a new proposal and uh, it's uh, natural to be a kind of a, a, a very different uh, topic for a presentation, but I really, uh, hope that uh, I could give some arguments saying that uh, carbon wealth taxation is necessary uh, because it's target, uh, targeting uh, um, something that, that regular capital taxation is not. And it really helps divesting from brown capital, which is something that we need to. Uh, it's also feasible, uh, an additional high capital gains taxation on brown companies is a revenue side uh, measure. Uh, and that means that it can implement it even in fiscal constraint scenarios. Uh, and it's effective. If it's high enough, it shifts returns on brown and green assets, consequently altering portfolio decisions. Investors allocate a higher share of capital to green companies, meaning more finance to the green transition and a better long-term wealth path. So that's it. Okay. Thank you, Zan. Great. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, comments and questions from the audience, please uh, raise your hands at those who want to address some comments. Uh, 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 Giuseppe, please. Uh, well, thank you for this uh, presentation. Now I have a couple of questions and uh, one is about the, the how can you tax uh, effectively people because you said that you want to raise this tax on capital gains, correct? Yes. And, and then you know that there are, in order to have capital gains, you have to sell shares. And if this doesn't happen, this uh, capital gains will never be taxed and there are, several tricks that especially um, internet companies uh, do adopt to never pay tax. And this one is one comment. And the second is about uh, the, the, the fact that if you use the same score across sectors, you know that there are sectors that by default, they consume more um, uh, CO2 because uh, for example, heavy industry by default has to use more CO2. So in this way, you, you select um, the, 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 those industries, you uh, discriminate those industries in favor of um, other kind of industries. 
the, the, those are the comments I would say. Uh, uh, so regarding the first one, I completely agree with you. It's something that even, I don't know if you followed the discussion to the Congress mm -hmm. three weeks ago, but it mm -hmm. was something that they were trying to uh, address. Mm -hmm. Basically, their proposal is to come up with this taxation uh, uh, real life. So it, it wouldn't require the uh, companies or the stock owners to chain, to uh, sell their, their stock in order to, do, to be taxed. And it didn't lead anywhere, but yeah, mm -hmm. that is a, a common problem in all kinds mm -hmm. of capital gain taxation. Mm -hmm. So of course, this one also uh, have the similar problem. Mm -hmm. And regarding this, your second question, I'm not sure if I understood quite well, uh, but uh, if not, we can continue to, to talk about it. But what we, we are doing here is like, because we're selecting only the, 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 the sectors uh, that pollute, um, we are actually um, we we are actually not not punishing them only because they are polluting, but uh, we're punishing punishing like we're taxing uh, precisely the companies inside these uh, carbon intensive sectors that are uh, that are not doing enough or that could be doing more than they are uh, actually doing in terms of uh, carbon transition policies. Um, moreover, I didn't talk about this here, but there is uh, the, uh, in our paper we, we, we say something about this. There is this whole uh, disclosure requirements initiatives from especially the European Central Bank and, and, and Bank of England. And then there they have the, this very granular um, assessment of, uh, of what each firm has to do and what each firm is currently doing regarding the green transition. So I would say that maybe this is a bigger uh, problem now, and especially with the data that we are using, but I think in four or five years, we're gonna have a better uh, framework to work on. Um, well, the, the thing is that if I'm not mistaken, you had two numbers, 5.6 and 7.2, something yeah. like this, yes? Yeah. So, so by default, you know that, uh, for example, if you produce um, iron, steel, you will consume more than a company that maybe is e the most polluting company that is producing something else, I don't know, uh, glass, uh, that is producing uh, whatever, plastic. Because yeah, but... uh, maybe because the, the, the carbon consumption because of this production requires much more car CO2. Sure. So you, this is maybe, why maybe you should discriminate these numbers within the industry. So you have to use different levels depending on the sector. Yeah, one way uh, that we try to get around this issue mm -hmm. was selecting only the, the emitting sectors. So we are not talking about like, for instance, plastic. Mm -hmm. We're talking about oil and gas, transportation, mm -hmm. chemistry, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is that this kind of grading, it already mm -hmm. takes into account uh, uh, the, the sector specificities. Mm -hmm. So this is like, this is coming from ESG framework and they have to grade in the end. They have to put a label if mm -hmm. it's AAA, if it's A or B plus, et cetera, et cetera. So they take into account this mm -hmm. in some way or another. So, okay. but, of that, but definitely it's a very pressing issue this one and uh, we should like uh, really address more carefully in the paper. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay, great, uh, great discussion. Uh, so uh, I guess uh, we can now move for the next presentation. Uh, Emmett Roy, uh, also PG student at the New School, uh, will present uh, his work, Green Monetary Policy to Combat Climate Change, Theory and Empirics. Emmett, are, are you there? Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you. So I'm sharing a screen. Uh, so can you kindly see my screen right now? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Leo. So uh, my topic today is about uh, the green monetary policy. 
So how actually the central bank can contribute to combat climate change and the main focus of the discussion would be what is there necessary to come into the platform of contribution to combat the climate change. So first I'm going to uh, discuss, give you a brief about uh, what is the rationale for the bringing into central bank in this climate change debate. Then we are going to see the mathematical models. And in finally, we'll discuss some empirical evidence in support of our uh, thesis. Okay. So, sorry. Uh, uh, sorry for the observations there. So, uh, again, as we all know, the climate change uh, poses economy wide and social challenges. And it is now widely saying that the financial system can play a central role in managing uh, the climate risks and financing from the high carbon economy to low carbon economy transitions. And why it is necessary for the central bank to come into play a role right there is that now the economics, mostly in the US and Europe, recognizing that the fast batch option the design to reduce the carbon as a carbon tax is actually failing to reach its goal. If you look at uh, the data, it said that the carbon price initiatives introduced, mostly the carbon tax and uh, emission tradable permits, would cover only 5.5% of global emission in 2021. And and most importantly, just 27 countries have so far introduced carbon tax officially as a policy to challenge the climate change. And United States and China, those two countries were responsible for more than 44% of the global emissions are still reluctant to adopt any carbon pricing such as carbon tax or tradable permits as an official policy. So if we look, uh, sorry, back to the map of the carbon tax surfer, uh, it is the 2021 map designed by the World Bank. They're saying the blue spots are actually denoting the places or countries those adopted the climate carbon tax session. However, you can see that the best place is covered by the Canada, but there is a surprising puzzle coming from the Canada's emission data that after introduction of the carbon taxation, their per capita carbon emission has actually increased instead of decreasing. So how is the challenge for the central banks? If you look at this uh, plots, this plot is based on the European Central Bank uh, modeling. So I made some modification and changes to introduce the climate effects in this model. That climate change actually affects the central bank main objectives. That is their uh, control of price, low inflation, high growth, low unemployment, and their instruments of operation, that is the interest rates, to multiple channels. So what are the channels? One channel is that due to the climate change, it affects their risk premium of the interest rates. It affects the current and future bank capitals. It affects the commodity prices for some countries due to some natural disruption, or uh, uh, say maybe flat hurricane and so on. The commodity prices are increasing because the productions of necessary goods are falling. And currently, we are also experiencing a uh, what is called supply chain crisis in the US and China and many other countries, and which is uh, maybe stimulated by some effect of climate change or not. And if it's this case, these all three phenomena, actually, all these phenomena is actually affecting the central bank 
interest rate policy, and it makes some, it creates some traps in terms of their credit flows, asset price, uh, bank rates, exchange rate policy. And as my previous speakers have discussed, there is some challenge in the demand and supply in the goods market and the labor market and so on. So ultimately, this is actually uh, affecting the main objective of central bank right now, the low inflations. So the European Central Bank have first take the initiatives and they officially make a statement that they should officially introduce the emission control in their policy objective of macroeconomic core. And so if we introduce now, along with the spice stability and higher growth, two more objectives, the related to the carbon, sorry, the climate change management, one is the emission control and financing low transition, transition to low carbon economy, then we can make a framework for the green monetary policy. So we are actually elaborating the current framework of dealing with the monetary policy in, by inclusion of new phenomena called the emission control. Now, a question is how are we going to do that? So we are going to introduce uh, a green interest rate that will actually have some climate risk premium in addition to the normal bank interest rate. And if that can be done, then it will ultimately affect the credit flow in the industrial sector and also consumption sector. And this will reduce the production of high carbon incentive goods, also the low carbon incentive goods and increase the flow of low carbon incentive industries and also housing and other consumption goods and ultimately through both channels of fall in the production and the carbon intensive production and increase the production of the low carbon intensive goods and reducing the carbon intensive goods consumption it will ultimately achieve the objective of reducing emission okay so to frame this in the mathematical framework, we adopt uh, the new Keynesian monetary policy frameworks and their frameworks was that, that actually specific to the monetary policy arena. So their objective is to minimize the losses coming from the gap between the current GDP and the potential GDP and the current inflation and the target inflation. So we introduce two many phenomena there is that reduce the emission gap that is between the current emission and the target emission and reduce the credit flow gap between the credit flow in the hard carbon intensive industry or consumption sector and low carbon uh, credit, credit sectors. And so we have some constraints as a design. That is the first constraints coming from the goods markets. That is the current, the dynamics of output depends on its current outputs and the interest rate phenomena and some damage. The damage is coming from the current emissions. And we are hoping that these dynamics will be affected through these credit flow channels. So if the introduction of a green interest rate may change the money market conditions and constraint between this high carbon intensive industry uh, sectors and low carbon sectors, then if the credit flow in the high carbon sector is going down, but is increasing the credit flow in the sectors of low carbon intensive sectors, we are saying that output will increase over time. And this is coming from the justification of uh, the previous uh, forecast from this, not just model this, if the current output is grow at the same rate, then in future, the output will fall because of the climate induced disasters. So 
if the green credit flow is increased against uh, high carbon intensive credit flow, uh, then in future, the dynamics will reverse, so output will increase instead of going down, that may be the first phase. And we have a proxy level market constraint that's coming from the Phillips curve, and we introduce an emission constraint. So our emission constraint, we are saying that there are a stock of emissions that is already in the environment that cannot be reduced either through carbon taxations, because if you introduce new carbon tax, that will reduce the emission of that based on new production, not that is existing. But if we introduce instead the low, what is called a credit flow in the low carbon intensive sectors, then they may actually introduce new technologies that not only can reduce the current emissions, but also can help to reduce the existing stock of emission in the atmosphere. And for this, as a control variable in the credit flow, we introduce two terms. What is the, our current interest rates? And we have- uh, Four minutes, sorry. I didn't okay, to uh, interrupt uh, you. Okay. And uh, there is the, we call the climatrix premium. So if we can set a parameter that's addition to the market interest rate as a climatrix premium, then the cr credit flow to the high carbon sector will reduce because the people that are trading into uh, what's called operating in the high carbon sectors, their cost of operation will increase because of that increase in these climate experience. On the other hand, the cost of operation in the green sector will be reduced because of this climate premium. So we have made some calibration on AMPL based on this model, but we are not going to report this because of the time constraints. We can just move to a very give you a brief about the empirical dividends so for you guys. So in our empirical models, we take dividends from uh, five countries, Brazil, China, European Union, India, and US, and data about 2004 to 2018. And we have the emission as a dependent variable, GDP, and the green credit flow, and the monetary interest rate, we call this green interest rate and inflation. And we take this data from international renewable energy about the emissions and green credit flow. The rest of the data are taking from this IMF stats. And so I'm not going to details about the test, but we can have some uh, show some in plus response functions that is coming from the VAR models. And we divide VAR model into two panels. One is the high inflation uh, that is called the low price regime and this or the uh, unstable price regime and the low inflation or stable price regime sector. So if you look at this uh, stable price regime, what is happening that if increase the green credit flow, then uh, our emissions is going down uh, and this impact of the GDP is, although there will be some negative impact in the first phase, but it will decay over time. And, uh, and but these emissions will also decrease. And even in the case of unstable price regime or high inflation case, if we introduce the green credit and interest rates, the impact on uh, what is called on GDP is not, will not be too, unstable on monetary policy or in the inflation dynamics, it will not affect so much. So uh, what is the sum uh, from the story is that if we introduce a green interest rate, ultimately, even it is a unstable price regime or a stable price regime, uh, whatever we made a classification, it will not interact with the other objectives of low inflation but it may have some exchange in this goal of higher output in the first few phases, but over the decades, after the few time steps, it will actually help to attain a dual objectives of, we call this low emission and price stability and a sustainable economy. So I'm concluding by thanking Professor William Simler 
for organizing the workshop and my thanks to our co-organizer Cho and Jose, to all participants and the presenters and any questions if you have. So thank you so much. Great, Emmett. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. So uh, please, uh, comments and questions uh, from the audience. Raise your hands, please, those who want to address comments. No? Uh, that's maybe one, one short remark. Uh, this is um, a very heavily uh, well, controversial um, in discussion in among central bankers. Should they intervene in a market neutral way or should they intervene selectively um, allocating, trying to stimulate, allo uh, stimulate the credit flows to certain industries and uh, uh, for the good, so to speak, of the uh, well, uh, moving more toward uh, a green economy. And um, it's an assumption in the model that um, maybe uh, somebody can ask this question later in the afternoon when Brunemeyer is there. He is one of the central bank advisors of the ECB. And uh, when I was at the ECB, I always faced the issue that they said, well, uh, that looks like industrial policy and we are not allowed to do this. <laughs> so uh, this, so this is um, concerning there. But I think uh, historically um, many central banks and governments did this. So you had uh, certain time periods after the war, whatever, bottlenecks industries and there was credit flows allocated and stimulated to flow to that. But nowadays they have this principle of market neutrality and Cochrane of Chicago or is now Stanford is heavily uh, fighting for this and so don't want to have any selective uh, policy. So uh, this might be a good uh, question for uh, our expert later. Uh, maybe uh, somebody can ask this. All right, so Giuseppe, you had some uh, other questions? No, 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 for me, it's perfectly fine and I agree with you. I am in the between the two positions, I would say that uh, uh, we know that uh, every, I cannot say country, but continent should have kind of control of the supply chain. So it cannot be that uh, Europe has no um, still at all, uh, uh, no, no means to, to produce uh, uh, vaccines when they are required and so on. And I. So in, I cannot say that uh, we need to be interventionist, but we cannot also ignore that we need uh, the, the control somehow of the, 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 of the, the, of the chain, of the, the industrial chain. Otherwise, when there is a crisis, uh, we are not prepared and we are completely um, exposed to the will of other continents. I think not in terms of countries, but in terms of continents. Yeah. Okay. Great, thank you. Emmet, any, any remark about the comments from Professor Rilio? Uh, okay. uh, thank you so much. Uh, so just, a, uh, just a one uh, feedback uh, that uh, now this, I think from the 2020 and onward development, uh, the, the, there are many research uh, have been conducted on what and there are theoretical argument that should central bank adopt emission and investor policy or not. And the new answer is that if they do not introduce the emission control as their objective, then after the two decades, they are not able to reach their objective uh, output control or the inflation control because the climate related disasters and other increase uh, would impact the supply chains, not in the country, in the, uh, globally. And they will not, uh, in this case, able to manage anything. And ultimately they have to move to something that is similar to industrial policy, or there will be then no need for a central bank. Because if all credit go to particular sectors, actually have the control over the credit 
in the economy. That, that's good. Thank you so much for the comments. Hey, great, great Emmett. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we can uh, move for the next presentation. Uh, uh, who will present is Abenais uh, Minefar. Uh, yes. <laughs> is it correct, <laughs> Benas? <laughs> How are yes. you? Uh, the, the work is limited yes. pricing and entry game Hi. of renewable energy firms into the energy sector. Please, great to have you here. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay, could you see the uh, yes. slide? Yes. Yes. Okay, that's great. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Samler, you and others for this workshop, and um, thank you others for attending this uh, workshop. Okay, the title of our uh, research is Limit Pricing and Entry Game of Renewable Energy Firms into the Energy Sector. Uh, at first, I want to have a brief over, uh, overview about uh, what we did. Um, in uh, order to combat the uh, climate change, uh, generally governments uh, try to provide uh, uh, incentives to replace old technologies with new ones, which they are based on renewable energy. But uh, we should consider that uh, still there are fossil fuel incumbents that uh, they prevent uh, the entrance of the renewable energy. Uh, on the other hand, uh, limit pricing is achieved when the, these dominant firms that here we consider these dominant firms as uh, uh, fossil fuels energy suppliers, uh, they face the entrance and the entrance of the renewable energy and they, uh, put, uh, they set the price below the monopoly profit maximizing level. In this way, they try to prevent the entrance of the renewable energy suppliers. So in this paper, uh, we try to consider this uh, context of the limit pricing and uh, we uh, study the behavior of the dominant firms when they face with the entrance of the uh, fringe firms. And uh, we made a, a game a theoretic stylization of competition between them, these two firms. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we wanted to investigate specifically the effect of the renewable energy uh, when we have the subsidies for renewable energy. And uh, we investigated the effect of that. Uh, in, uh, in this uh, study, we use the nonlinear model predictive control that uh, later I will explain uh, a little bit about that and uh, I will say why we choose this technique. Maybe some of you uh, already are familiar with this technique because maybe you're working with Professor Samler, you know, uh, you heard about this or uh, I will explain a little bit because we have time constraint so um but, but I, sorry uh, you, you you're changing your slides because you're still in the first one right sorry are, are you are you changing your slides but just because i cannot see the first yes slide. uh now i change my slide yeah, you can see uh, uh, it's a start with the our results show that the initial level I st you will I, you can see i still can see the first one. Oh, how about the others uh, you cannot it's, it's, see. It's only in the in the first presentation. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I try again to do that. Um, sorry, sorry for interrupting you. Sorry that uh, there is a problem. <laughs> I try to do it. I, I think you either have to share your screen so we can see when you switch to the presentation mode, or if you share your PowerPoint, yes. if you share your PowerPoint <laughs> I, window, then you need to share it after. Okay, uh, this is okay. We don't go to the full screen. We continue in this way. Uh, you see? Yes. Now, 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 now we can see that it changed for the second. Okay, one, right? so it's better. I don't go to the full screen, so it's better in this way. Uh, so. Uh, we are here. I wanted to have an overview of our results uh, that um, our results show that the initial level of the renewables cash flow uh, has an important uh, role uh, uh, when we want to predict the dominant firm's uh, behavior. 
uh, it means that when the fringe firms enter the game, uh, enter the game, enter the market with a positive cash flow, uh, they don't face with the immediate uh, response of the um, uh, immediate response for the dominant firms. But if they uh, enter with the negative cash flow, uh, they will uh, see that uh, the price decrease uh, faster. Uh, on the other hand, we understood that uh, according to our result, the dominant firms are more sensitive uh, to the uh, renew, uh, subsidies for the renewable compared with other supportive policies. Uh, so we are going to details to see how we got this result. Uh, as we know, and according to the previous studies, we know that there is a high correlation between the use of the and consumption of the fossil fuels and climate disasters. So many studies are concentrated on the transition from fossil fuels uh, to renewable resources. Uh, in this paper, we concentrate on the limit pricing part of this transition. Uh, it means that uh, we consider a, a dynamic interaction between the two kinds of the firms, uh, fossil fuels and renewable, and we, we want to see how uh, they interact with each other when uh, there is the threat of entrance of the uh, renewable energy in the market. And uh, specifically, we want to assess the effect of the subsidies to renewable energy. Uh, but um, before that, I want to have a very brief explanation about the notion of the NMPC for uh, those uh, they don't know about uh, this technique. Uh, this is a residing horizon. NMPC or nonlinear model predictive control is a residing horizon model. It means that instead of making the prediction for the entire time, uh, we uh, just uh, set a time horizon. And in each instant of the time, we make the prediction for that uh, time horizon and, uh, in the, and we shift forward in the next time. And according to the result that we received, we make the prediction for the next time uh, horizon. Uh, the other uh, privilege of this technique is that uh, when uh, we use this technique uh, in each instant of the time, again, firms uh, can predict the effects of their actions and those of uh, their opponents. Uh, so we use this privilege and in this uh, research, we couldn't uh, have both of the firms as active firms because uh, previous studies, because of the limitation of the techniques, they couldn't uh, consider both of the fringe firms and dominant firms as the active uh, firms and they just consider one as active and the other one as the passive. Uh, so uh, this was the reason that uh, we choose this uh, technique to use in this uh, study. Here we have a very brief uh, overview for the empirical part and as you can see uh, over the last uh, years uh, the renewable participation in the global energy has increased and we can uh, particularly mention the electricity investment in the European Union and the United States. Uh, also, we can see that in the uh, in recent years, renewable energy costs uh, also uh, have a uh, have a massive reduction, and we can uh, uh, say that uh, we can. Uh, I mean, uh, it can be explained that, uh, by the uh, invest uh, by the investment in the technology and the improvement in the technology and also uh, the public support uh, that they uh, receive. Now we are going to the part of the dynamic and uh, I want to say that how we made this uh, dynamic model. Okay, here uh, we, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we wanted to uh, assess the interaction between these uh, two groups of the firms. Uh, we consider we uh, consider in this model dominant firms as the price setters and fringe firms as price taker. Uh, it means that dominant firms can determine the fringe uh, earnings by setting the price, and the fringe firms uh, can uh, um, uh, by setting the output quantities uh, can choose the retained earnings. Uh, so uh, it means that the, cur the current price determines the fringe uh, earnings. Consequently, higher price will lead to a higher level of the fringe firm's uh, capacity and vice versa. 
in this way, we can consider the uh, fringe uh, capacity uh, as a state variable for both player, because at the same time, dominant firm try to decrease it and the uh, fringe firms uh, try to increase this capacity. Here we have the, uh, we uh, can see that how fringe capacity evolved according to the time. And uh, we will see that it's a function of the price, marginal cost, retained uh, earnings as, a, as an important uh, variables inside that. And then we should have the optimization problem of the both uh, of the firms, fringe firms and uh, dominant firms. Here uh, you can see the dominant firms optimization problem. Because at, this, uh, uh, at the, each instant of the time, both of the firms want to maximize their profit. Uh, here we can uh, see that the uh, uh, profit, uh, we can see that the optimization problem subjected to the uh, fringe capacity here, we will have it. And uh, uh, we have here the, uh, pro uh, the optimization, sorry, the optimization problem for the uh, fringe firms. Uh, can, uh, we can see that also it's a function of the marginal cost for the fringe and uh, retained uh, earnings as a control variable. So here uh, we use our uh, technique, an MPC technique, and uh, the uh, iterative solutions of the optimization problem give us uh, some fixed point uh, about uh, for the price and uh, retained earnings. Uh, in the during the time, uh, the sequence of these fixed points uh, make our equilibrium uh, for the um, fringe uh, for the fringe capacity, which is uh, our uh, state variable. Uh, Five minutes. Thank you. Uh, yes. So, uh, okay. Uh, so I try to be. Uh, we consider, uh, we uh, did our simulation in three cases. We consider that the fringe firms uh, enter the game with the positive cash flow, negative, and con uh, specifically we assess the effect of the uh, subsidies uh, on renewable. Here you can uh, see that the positive cash flow effect. Um, positive cash flow effect. And uh, as you can see here, fringe capacity, uh, the fringe, ca uh, fringe uh, firms uh, enter the game with the positive cash flow. Uh, we will see that, uh, we see that here uh, for the first period, the uh, dominant firm, they uh, don't uh, react to this interest. But after the second period, uh, they uh, make less uh, the, the price for uh, preventing the interest of the fringe firms in the market. But we can see that uh, according, uh, although this happens, but, um, but the fringe capacity has an uh, increase here uh, very sharply and got the steady state here. Uh, here, uh, we have the numerical result, which uh, we obtained from the NMPC technique that we use. We, uh, here, we have the numerical result and we can see that uh, the how the fringe firms to start with the positive cash flow uh, reaches high level of the profit and uh, decrease gradually up to the steady state. And on the other hand, we can see that the dominant firm, which started with a high level of the uh, profit, uh, decreased this profit. Uh, and uh, according to our result, uh, near the period uh, number eight, uh, it will be near the zero. This can explain why during the time. Uh, renewable, uh, the renewables become uh, superior while, while using uh, retained earnings for increasing the capacity. Uh, the other uh, case is the negative cash flow that uh, you can see here. The difference uh, that uh, you can see here is the uh, price. We can see that if the fringe firms enter the market with a negative cash flow uh, from the first period, the uh, dominant firms, um, uh, they uh, try to decrease the price uh, for preventing the entrance of the fringe firms. This is the difference. But uh, for the uh, fringe capacity, again, we can see that they can uh, earn the high level and uh, they get the steady state. Uh, okay, so we are going to the 
here we are going to the numerical result of the negative cash flow. And uh, again, we will see uh, we see here that it started with the negative cash flow uh, fringe firms, but again, uh, they reach a high level of the profit and they uh, gradually decrease. It's, uh, it's like a previous graph. Uh, and uh, also dominant firms uh, decrease gradually. So it means that uh, uh, although they started to go to the market with a negative cash flow, but they could uh, remain in the market and also earn a good level of the profit. Uh, the last case is the effect of the renewable energy subsidies. Uh, the difference again is on the price you can see. Uh, here, when uh, mm, dominant firms see that uh, renewable energy has a, a support, public support of the subsidies, at first try to uh, decrease, uh, uh, increase the price and then uh, decrease the price uh, for preventing. This is a difference. And you can see uh, that here, the slope of the fringe uh, capacity also a little bit different, but uh, finally uh, get the steady state uh, like the previous cases. Uh, so uh, this is uh, the numerical part. Also, the numerical part is a little bit uh, different. We can uh, see that here uh, in the first period uh, when uh, they uh, have the energy subsidy support uh, in the first period, uh, the profit is zero for the fringe firms. But uh, the, another difference is that uh, they get higher level of the profit in this case. Uh, although gradually again uh, it's a decrease uh, and uh, get the level the steady state level like the previous cases but uh, at first uh, get the higher level but we should consider that uh, for energy subsidies uh, this uh, energy subsidy help the fringe firms to take off and get to the market but when they arrive to the good point and a good position for the competition this uh, should be cut back this support should be cut back uh, so again, uh, we come back uh, to the uh, our results, and now we saw that how the initial uh, value of the cash uh, renewables cash flow affect the behavior of the dominant firms, and uh, we saw that uh, how the dominant firms uh, are more sensitive for the uh, renewables uh, when they face with the renewable subsidies. Uh, and uh, our simulation, uh, you saw that show it, uh, according to our simulation, we can see that uh, when uh, they have the subsidies, they have the sub public support of the renewable subsidies, they will uh, earn a higher profit uh, at first. Uh, however, after some periods, again, uh, reach the same steady state uh, as the previous cases. Uh, some important literature and uh, thank you. I think I hope I am in time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, your time. Yeah, and also we had this technical issue <laughs> during the presentation. <laughs> thank you, Venas, for your clear presentation. Uh, thank you. Any comments, questions from the audience, suggestions? Raise your hands, those who want to address some questions. No, uh, no question. <clears throat> yeah, but maybe uh, uh, Ro oh, Robert. Yeah. Robert, there's somebody else. Let me go. Robert, please. Uh, yes, yeah, so thank you for the presentation and this work. How can we get more political support for subsidies? God knows we need it. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Do you have any ideas? It's, it seems to be so difficult. For the subsidies. For the yes. subsidies. Yes, for this country <laughs> and for, for overseas too, for that matter. I would say we need a new global financial system also to support for greater uh, flexibility. <laughs> we hope that we have this support. So according to this whole we simulate our model. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you. Well, maybe uh, one of my the subsidies, uh, I mean, there's an incredible amount of subsidies for the fossil fuel industry. And over time, in the last 50 years, 60 years, they have um, basically been maintained. 
and there were political forces that actually uh, um, well uh, kept this going. But uh, in uh, in um, Glasgow now, this was one of the issues to uh, reduce the subsidies of fossil fuel. So uh, it will be a hard fight too. Uh, but um, uh, theoretically, uh, so to speak, one knows that um, in these uh, type of models where you have uh, uh, big uh, externalities, positive or negative, you need some uh, you know, tax and subsidy scheme. But in practice, it's probably, um, well, out of favor at the moment to introduce subsidies for uh, green energy, and at least in the US, but it's not so in Europe or in other countries. So it's a little bit US culture that you have some resistance to that, but not so much in Europe or what is that other cultures, I would say. Yeah? Euro Europeans are smarter. There is a movement uh, on some of the investment banks and some of the uh, the financial impacts to climate extreme, extremes and standards by the federal uh, um, the federal reserve what do you think of that are you familiar with that some of the political pressure to get the feds to start oh, yeah. looking at the financial impacts on institutions and insurance companies for uh, climate extremes and impacts it costs money as towns go into water, they're all blown away, or farmers go out of business, or food prices go up. That's different, but yes, there's a big controversy about these um, well, mandates of uh, central banks in one or the other direction. That is true, but uh, well, maybe it depends on the next. Uh, central bank uh, CEO, <laughs> what will be the uh, uh, move of the central bank. So I know there's this big controversy, but uh, uh, I think it's also less in Europe. So in uh, European central bank, it's different views than in the US central bank um, discussions. We need better politics. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I tried to get you some support with uh, some doctors who worked on the climate impacts also on our children. That could be a big political change, I believe. Maybe they can get more help when we can work with them. The UN mental health uh, um, uh, NGOs did a whole report on the impact of climate change. I sent it. I'll send it to you later. I sent it to former President Van Zandt, I say, but I tried to get more, more people looking at your, your work, important work, and you pay for these things. <laughs> Thank you. Good. <laughs> okay. Great. Great discussion. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, uh, ben Nice, do you want to do any remark or uh, can we move or do we move to the next uh, presenter? Uh, I don't have. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> no, th thank you for, for joining us uh, from, from Italy. Are you in Italy right now? Yes. From <laughs> yes, Italy. I'm in. Yes. Hi, from Italy. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so uh, let's move to the next present presenter, uh, Hanning. Uh, our colleague at the New School, uh, she will present uh, cryptocurrency, uh, uh, exclamation remark, as legal, te legal tender and digitalization of current system. Anin, please, I, I guess, Ben, as you have to stop sharing your screen, please, so Anin can present her cryptocurrency work. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, um, Professor Semler, for inviting me um, to present. And thank you, Joao and Jose, for um, organizing. Can you see my screen? 
Yes. Okay. There we go. Okay, so um, today I would be um, talking about cryptocurrency, specifically Bitcoin, and to try to answer the question if Bitcoin or a cryptocurrency is actually money. Um, so the research that I've been working on in general has to do with money and especially the digitalization of money. Um, so for the agenda today, we're just gonna briefly go over the different kinds of money that are being discussed um, right now in policy circles. And then we will take a look at the Bitcoin ecosystem. And after we get a brief understanding of the Bitcoin ecosystem and bear with me because it's complex and technical. And if you have questions in the middle, please do feel free to um, stop me for clarifications. And then we will go into um, answering the question of is Bitcoin money? And the way I'm trying to answer this question is by this um, setting up this triangular approach that um, looks at the functions of money and then looks at the different theoretical frameworks um, in, in how they view money and then look at a third um, category, which I call supply and intermediation. Um, and that looks at the supply of money and then who is intermediating it basically. And then we can discuss a little bit of policy implications um, for a wider adoption. But the point is the conclusion that I would like to arrive to, the, the hypothesis, is that Bitcoin um, and similar currencies or assets are actually not money, um, as hopefully I will be able to persuade you to believe. Now, um, a quick disclaimer, this research is very preliminary. So the framework is still not developed fully. So I would like to get um, feedback and ideas, but just keep that in mind as I'm going through as I'm going through the work. Okay, so the type of digital money that we have now is the central bank digital currencies. And that's just a digital uh, form of fiat, basically. It's just a technological improvement on fiat. And then we have stable coins, which are coins by private entities that are supposed to be backed one-to-one -one by a national currency. An example of that is um, Facebook's project Libra, which is now called DM, which has been put on hold because um, policymakers think is very problematic, which they have every um, reason to, to, to think so. But again, this is something that's still backed by um, um, a national currency. And then there's, there's um, cryptocurrencies, and I will be using Bitcoin strictly as an example for this analysis. And B Bitcoin is something that is not backed or guaranteed by anything or any entity. So it's not, it's not safe, it's risky, um, and it should be heavily regulated, in my opinion. Okay, so some of the literature I use here, I will highlight two, um, which is um, Abadi and Brunner Meyer's blockchain economics and um, Markov and Skowar uh, blockchain analysis um, of the Bitcoin market. I mean, the, the literature is growing and the list I'm using is large, and, but those are the two main um, important works that I've been building on. So just briefly, the Bitcoin ecosystem. I always like to make a distinction when trying to explain um, um, this technology because there's this confusion that Bitcoin is the blockchain and blockchain is Bitcoin. And no, Bitcoin is a product. It's this idea, it's this fantasy that we will have this money that is not uh, run by a government and it's decentralized and it's um, inclusive and equitable and run by the people. It's an idea. And then that idea was formalized and it was formalized um, through very complex um, coding and very complex math. And it lives on the technology, which is the blockchain. The blockchain in a very simple sense is a network, um, a ledger, basically for data keeping. The blockchain can be centralized or decentralized. It's not by nature a decentralized network. It can be either or. 
because the blockchain just refers to how the information is stored, which is exactly like a block. There's a transaction, there's a contract, it goes into a block, and that block is added to the chain, and then it is just not reversible. Um, the idea of Bitcoin and how they're using this blockchain is that it's permissionless proof of work. Um, so it's a decentralized network. Anyone can go in to proof the work or proof the transactions um, that are going on on the, on the network. And it's anonymous. Again, that is by design and not necessarily a feature of a blockchain. And I say this and I insist on this because this is important because institutions are talking about uh, using blockchain. And people keep thinking that blockchain is this um, mystical uh, ent entity or thing, and it's not. It's designed to be the way it's functioning now for Bitcoin, but it doesn't have to be anonymous. It could be partially anonymous. So all these things are done by design. And the more important part is that blocks are unchangeable. And that is a feature of the blockchain, can't be changed. Another aspect, so we have the product, which is the Bitcoin, which is this idea. And then we have the blockchain, which is the technology that the product lives on. And then we have the process, which is the mining. And what this means basically is that there are people out there who are monitoring the network, who um, allow the network by downloading a software to live on their computer and they start solving very complex mathematical puzzles to process transactions, regardless of what those transactions are. And they do that because when they process transactions and they form blocks that they attach to the chain, they get rewards in Bitcoin. And we will get into much more detail um, about this structure, this reward structure, um, and the supply of Bitcoin um, in the analysis part. Uh, so bear with me if it's not very clear right now. And this uses very high level of um, uh, cons consumption, of electric consumption. So just a few important figures. Um, the price of Bitcoin today or yesterday is around $64,000 um, per Bitcoin. Um, market capitalization, is in billions or trillions. And then important um, figure to, 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 to know, and this will also um, come back up when we go to the analysis part, is that Bitcoin um, supply is capped at 21 million Bitcoins. So that is the maximum number of Bitcoins that can be mined or that can be um, you know, circulated in the market. And so far, um, around 18 million uh, bitcoins have been mined already. So we're very close to that, to that cutoff. But as we will see in the analysis part, um, it diminishes, the rate diminishes as more bitcoins are mined. So it slows down and, and, and we will see that in a second. Okay, so here I use um, a graph from Markov and Skowar uh, research. And while this has a lot of information in it, what I would like to highlight is this part, is the green part, is the real volume part. Because those two basically are transactions where between people on the blockchain or between individual and their different accounts. And they're done, this is done for technical reasons to slow things down. And this is done just to, um, split up accounts. I mean, I'm, simpl I'm simplifying, but what I want you to um, take a look at is this. This is the real, what they call the real volume. And this is transfer between clusters that are controlled by different users. And why is this important? This is important because once we take that real um, volume and decompose it, well, when, when they take it and decompose it, um, what I am interested in is the payment process part, which is this part right here which hardly makes up not even 5% of, of, um, of the transactions and um, exchanges. Yeah, so this, this, I'm highlighting this because when we go to the analysis part and start talking about Bitcoin as a medium of exchange, statistically, based on data, the amount of transactions that are using Bitcoin, the amount to trans, the use for, of Bitcoin to transact is very, very limited. 
Uh, honey, five minutes. Oh, okay. Um, data usage is very high. It's between Malaysia and Egypt, mostly concentrated in China and in the US. Okay, so now it's Bitcoin money. And like I said, functions of money, supply of money, and theoretical frameworks. Because we're short on time, I'm gonna skip this. I'm gonna go through this very quickly. It's not a medium of exchange, like because we just saw, um, not, no, not everyone is using it. And even if something is used temporarily as a medium of exchange, doesn't make it money. No one quotes their products in, in Bitcoin. It's always quoted in a national currency. And it's not a store of value because store of value is important in the short term. And if I buy something today for a dollar, I don't want to find out tomorrow that it cost me 10. And the more speculative it becomes, the less of a money it is. So it's not a store of value. And this is if we look at the value of Bitcoin. I mean, it's the stability is the instability is, is higher than any um, currency in history. And this is the realized volatility. So the volatility reaches almost 600%. Um, uh, at some point, so it's very high. The other aspect, the other category that I use, which I try to run it through um, theoretical frameworks, and again, because we're short on time, it, the answer is never yes, regardless of which theoretical framework I follow to answer the question of is Bitcoin money? It's not a commodity, it's not a state invention, not a legal tender, it's not on anyone's balance sheet, so no, by any theoretical framework, it's not um, it's not a legal tender and it's not it's not money. Okay, now the, the more important part, which is which is the supply of um, the supply and intermediation. This is just to show you how how it's, it happens. Someone does a transaction, they publish it, it takes part in a block, and then it's published to the network asking for people to start to mine it, and then the mining process happens. It has to get approved, um, and the miner gets the award, and the person that was supposed to receive the original payment up here gets the money. Now, in the supply, the supply of Bitcoin is what I'm really interested in, and it's important because it's it decreases. So, awards used to be fifty coins per block. And every four years, they get halved. So in 2012, the award per block is 25 Bitcoins. In 2016, the award became 12.5 Bitcoins. And in 2020, it became 6.25 Bitcoins. And now, now that's important because, let me, let's, let's just look at this briefly. As the supply goes down, as the reward goes down um, of Bitcoin, the difficulty of mining goes up. So it's not like you can mine um, as many Bitcoins or as many blocks as the supply goes down. So this is an interesting relationship here that I would like to um, look at and explore. And basically here we're looking at the total Bitcoin in circulation. So we see that it's increasing, but at a decreasing rate. And the red line is the average price. So we see how the price um, starts to shoot up um, in 2016. And then this is the, net, the, the yellow line is the network difficulty. So difficulty is becoming increasingly harder and harder to mine, which means um, it requires more time. And more importantly, it requires more energy. Um, so this is another graph that um, is interesting because it's telling us um, where the halving happened. So this is the first halving, 2012, and then 2016, and then 2020. And if the yellow line uh, is the price of the Bitcoin, and we see that there's a jump, there's a shoot up every time after the halving. And soon we will be able to see if this, if this jump will happen, sorry about that, if this jump will happen again here. Um, and this is where I would like to use either a regime switching model um, or a threshold, anal threshold analysis um, uh, to, to, to understand this behavior and what kind of, what kind of trends um, are actually there. Um, and those are both um, methods um, that Professor Semler um, uses in his, in his work and his analysis. And finally, just to wrap up, this is, looking at the supply 
and how it plateaus. It starts, it, we're now at already at 18 point something million. So the supply is going to be to, be, to become decreasing, um, increasingly um, smaller and the reward will become increasingly smaller. Um, and why is this important? This is important because we will go to the policy implications. If money, so Bitcoin reward tends to zero. And trans, so if, if the rewards tend to zero, then the transaction fees must kick in because otherwise, why would anyone mine? So if it becomes this structure where you have a supply and the supply stopped, it's capped at 21 million. So miners are no longer rewarded by Bitcoins. They need to be rewarded by, um, uh, fees and miners are already pooled four of the biggest mining pools make up more than 50 percent of uh, miners so who will be intermediating bitcoin because it, it needs to become organized at that point um, and how is that better or safer than our um, current system also because the monetary base cannot be expanded the currency would, if it continues to be used, it would be subject to severe deflation, um, which, is, which is very problematic. Um, and again, it's, we don't know who it's controlled by. Um, so it's, it's, it's the, the systematic risk in entrusting this control um, of a widely used store of value. It won't become a widely used, but even if it does, to unknown entity is, entities is very risky. And then, to expand the supply of Bitcoin after the limit is reached, after the limit is reached, requires flat fractional reserve. But again, what's the point? If we are going to replicate the system that we are currently using and have it be, um, have the underbed of it be uh, an, an, an anonymous um, entity or a non-entity, then we are just introducing additional risks to a system that is already risky. Um, so the answer to the question is no, Bitcoin is not money. And I am um, confident that once um, the models are applied and the analysis is, is, is taken to a more deeper, de deeper level, this will still be the answer. Thank you very much. Okay, great, Tani. Thanks, thank you. Uh, and also probably when it comes to development uh, challenge as climate, as we discussed it today, it goes against uh, the idea of, of uh, Ahmed, for example, of uh, channeling uh, financial flows to uh, uh, investments or, or that are more sustainable, etc. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, Andreas has a question, right? Yeah, um, well, thanks, Anin, for the presentation. It was really interesting. Um, myself, not very invested into Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. So, whenever I hear something about it, I learn something new. And also, again, today from your presentation, which was interesting. I yeah, just want to ask you like a question of your personal opinion or outline based on what you learned and read so far. Um, I heard that our, the, uh, incoming mayor of New York City, Eric Adams, wants to get his first three paychecks in cryptocurrency, which kind of led to a lot of um, wondering from economists like Paul Krugman, who Twittered about it and was like, this is so dumb that it's happening. And I mean, the outline that you gave for Bitcoin seems like not something very optimistic in terms of a lot of, a lot of bottlenecks and uh, unregulated non-regulated issues there but there are a lot of other cryptocurrencies like i don't know ethereum or others is that kind of only just the starting point or with these kind of developments do you see that there will be actually more regulation coming or do you think that with those new tipping points that are about to arrive with bitcoin that there will be actually some drop again in, in their popularity and reorientation yeah what's what's in the cards <laughs> yeah, my, my, my comment was a provocation too, if you want to answer as well, Henny. And actually, uh, in two minutes, so so we can have a, a break uh, before sure. Bernard Meyer, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, sorry, did you say you had a comment as well, Joao, or you just no, no? I, the comment I had was also a provocation. If you if you want to discuss this as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Okay, so so the short answer is we don't really know. No one does what will happen. What no one knows what what's what's going to happen next. Um, but to answer your question, Andy, I think those are two different things: um, regulation and uh, public uh, sector. You know, qualifying it as legal tender, like we saw in El Salvador, the entire country now adopted Bitcoin as legal tender is one thing. And then having the Bitcoin enthusiasts, which I don't know if we can call them that still, because big institution invest, institutional investors moved into the space. And you now started seeing Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, but especially Bitcoin on portfolios of major institutional investors. And this is something that I will look further into. Um, most research is, most economic research, even research in sociology and anthropology is mostly in agreement that something that is decentralized run by an anonymous entity or non-entity um, with a limited supply can't be money and it's very unstable. What will happen possibly is that it will get regulated. Most governments are being very aggressive um, about regulating cryptocurrencies. If a cryptocurrency gets regulated, then it could reach a point where it's actually not very different from how um, money is um, supplied into the market today because we all know that money is now controlled and supplied by private banks. So if private entities come in and are regulated and, they, and they're um, intermediating the supply of Bitcoin or any cryptocurrency, then what is the real difference between what, that, what will happen and the current system we have? The one real difference that I'm trying, um, I'm, 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 I'm seeing is that you have an unstable um, foundation, which is this decentralized, distributed ledger, controlled, not controlled by a central entity. But everything else, all the layers that will come above it are similar to our current system. So what's the point? I don't see an advantage. Um, also, mining um, is, because mining is clustered, holders of Bitcoins are clustered. So this also will have big implications on distribution. Um, the, the, this, this claim that it's inclusive is, is um, is, is, is false because distribution is actually um, probably staying the same, maybe, but just moving, um, moving to a different to a different space. Okay, great, Henny. Um, so I believe we should move to the break. Yes. So can we have only a um, little time left, but it was a wonderful presentation, though. Well, a number, a great presentation of all the, the presentations, and um, I think uh, among us we will probably continue discussing a lot of these topics. And uh, the um, next step will be a two o'clock event with uh, Markus Bronemeyer, and the dean will introduce this, and so then we will have some some number of comments and questions. I had uh, uh, appointed some secret panel there already for asking questions so those people who are asking questions or should ask questions no uh, so i think we take a quick break now um to uh, maybe give five minutes to well i have to be earlier there probably 10 minutes to, to back into the zoom link there um okay so um, i hope to see you all back later with uh, uh, the Brunemeyer talk at two o'clock. Uh, Joe, can I just talk to you a little bit? Maybe Andreas too. So and uh, Jose. Yes, sure. Thank you, everyone. See you shortly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. We are done. Uh, just quickly to organize this, so um, it's in case something goes wrong, Andreas know his, uh, knows his job already. Also, you should keep track of the uh, chats there and maybe um, communicate to, to me or you read them there when you have questions. I will go through probably three, four uh, 
commentators or people who ask questions. I'm not sure if uh, Teresa will be there. And uh, uh, I will first, uh, well, we let him speak. He, uh, the time is somewhat uh, not defined, so the, the, how long he will talk. But uh, I said, well, it's up to you. It depends on what, how much you want to present. And I will give some comments probably for 10, 15 minutes, and then some others can step in. But uh, he, he gets the comments or questions step by step. Um, I have a technical question. How did you switch, so to speak, for the presentation uh, to the full gallery view that I could see everybody? Uh, was it just when you exit the um, presentation, uh, then you get to this gallery view? Jose had done it very 